Hello, brothers and sisters, my apostate brethren, the old Jehovah's Witness, he's peeking in from the side. Nice to see you. I have a new video for you. It's got script. It's got notes. I hope you're going to enjoy it. My phone's falling over. It's very professional, isn't it? You don't get this kind of thing with John Cedars. Uh, do you like the beard? I've been growing a beard recently. It's because I was in hospital, but I'm feeling much better now. I think it's time to shave it off. My new video. The 10 Biggest Mistakes of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I hope you enjoy. Moving in at number 10, Miracle Wheat. This marks the beginning of over a century of rotten cons and failed prophecies. You see, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, or Bible students, was a beardy, would-be minister who wanted his own church. In order to get some more money, he decided to buy cheap seed and then bless it and resale them to gullible and often poor followers with the promise of magnificent yields. When a national newspaper pointed out this rank fraud, Charlie Taze Russell sued them and lost spectacularly after the US government studied his seeds and decided that it was of very poor quality. Now Russell claimed that all the profit he made from this scam went not to him but to the Watchtower Society. But since he owned 990 shares of the 1,000 that existed, he was really getting $9.90 out of every $10 that had been stolen. Oh dear. Moving on. Number 9. Pyramidology. Since the Bible has been written, there's always been people who thought it contained a secret message. These people are usually the only ones who can fully understand these messages because they only ever existed in their own heads to begin with. It's hard to find a new wrinkle to the whole secret message deal, but back in Charles Taze Russell's day, he jumped straight in to pyramidology. This is the belief that God made the pyramids, because you know, they're big and pointy, and they point to the sky, <laughs> and that by measuring them, you can get special secrets from the Bible, and maybe even dates for the end of the world. Ooh, exciting. Though the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in pyramidology anymore, they do continue to keep the dates their founder pulled out of his ass as he measured the pyramids. In case you think Jehovah's Witnesses are embarrassed by any of this, ask one. He won't know anything about it because they never talk about it. And number eight, 1914. Have you ever wondered when the world will end? Well, if you've been brought up in an end of the world doomsday cult, the answer is going to be all the damn time. And that thought will stick in your head like an ear bug. Or earworm, you Americans call it, until the day you die. But you're in luck, my friends. There will always be a doomsday cult for, for you to please you and satisfy your needs. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have an enviable record in making groundless claims that the end is nigh. Not for them this wussy, uh, sometime soon style of predicting the future. <laughs> oh no. They nail their balls to the wall with a date, and only years after it passes do they get together and think about how best to pretend they never said what they did. Well, back in the early days, the Jehovah's Witnesses became convinced that 1914 would mark the return of Jesus to judge mankind. This was a great way to attract new members, but left them with a bit of a headache when 1914 passed and Jesus rudely refused to show up at the party. Well, never fear, because they came up with a doozy of an explanation. You see, Jesus did turn up, but he came invisibly. I do that all the time. <laughs> During this secret mission on Earth, this Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise beside him, he judged mankind and conveniently chose the Jehovah's Witness as his sole representative on Earth. Fuck me, that's handy, isn't it? Since then, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been insulting and attacking every other religion on Earth. Well, Jesus didn't pick you, did he? Number seven! 1918. Did you go to church? Do you? Good for you. Because back in 1918 it was all supposed to end. You see, Jesus was going to come and he was going to wipe out all false religion and leave only people with the correct one. Islam. <laughs> I get it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. I won't go into it anymore now, but I will end with a few more dates that the Jehovah's Witnesses have falsely claimed would be important or would mark the end of the world. 1798, 1799, 1829, 1840, 44, 46, 73, 74, 78, and 80, 81, 1806, 1910, 14, 15, 17, 18, 20, 21, 25, 32, 35, 40, 51, 74, 80, 86, and the year 2000. And now, coming to a cinema near you now, 
2033, maybe. Number six, Malawi and Mexico. What the two countries on different continents of the world, thousands of miles apart, have in common? Well, they both have the cult known as Jehovah's Witnesses. It was in the, both these countries in that the Jehovah's Witnesses were faced with the issue of maintaining political neutrality as they saw it. In the 70s and 80s, the Jeho thousands of Mal Malawian Jehovah's Witnesses were beaten, arrested, imprisoned, tortured and raped. All because they refused to buy a party card from their despotic, shitty government. They were ordered by the Jehovah's Witnesses' New York leadership to do this, despite the consequences, because it was considered that dying was a small price to pay in order to keep a clean conscience with God. During this time, Jehovah's Witness publications were boasting about their courage, regularly writing about how these young men and women were being raped, tortured, mutilated. At least one was a pregnant woman. Wow, what bravery! These poor people they showed. It's amazing. They stood up to their terrible African dictators, even knowing that they would suffer beyond our worst nightmares. So how did the Jehovah's Witnesses deal with this when it popped up closer to home? Yeah, not, not great. Well, at exactly the same time, the Jehovah's Witnesses of Mexico were obliged to have completed military service at a certain age. Now, what's a good Jehovah's Witness going to do? When he's told he has to join the army, complete his training, and then register in the first reserve of the Mexican military. That's right, pay a bribe. You see, the Mexican Jehovah's Witnesses had long ago worked out an arrangement with the military. They handed them a bunch of money, and then they got a document back saying that they had been trained and were now soldiers. After many years of this scam, some of the Jehovah's Witnesses had actually reached quite high ranks in the military. Now, to their credit, the Mexican brothers realized that maybe just maybe they were a big bunch of dishonest, cheating bastards. And so they wrote to their bosses in Brooklyn asking for advice. We'll never know whether it was because they asked nicely or that they had lighter skin tones, but the Jehovah's Witness leadership decided that being a secret soldier and paying bribes to the military in Mexico was completely consistent with a Christian life as a Jehovah's Witness. So long as they didn't mention it to anyone, because Jehovah's Witnesses certainly weren't going to mention it for them. And so it was that a black lady in Africa can be raped and mutilated while a Mexican teenager can be a fully paid up Jehovah's Witness while paying bribes and pretend to be G.I. Jose. Appalling, isn't it? Number five. I'm zooming down. Supporting Germany. This will be a good one. Back in the 1930s, a new and dark menace arose in Europe. The Nazis. You might have thought that the casual violence, murder of the handicapped, destruction of Jewish synagogues, love for the occult, predisposition to cover their uniforms with skulls, death heads and blackness, and the near universal disgust shown around the world for, by their, beha for their behaviour would suggest to everyone what side was the body. But you don't know the Jehovah's Witnesses. In order to avoid the same persecution that more honourable religions were facing and to keep their property, the Jehovah's Witness leader at the time, Joseph Judge Rutherford, sent Hitler a letter. In it, he did what was natural to him at the time. He praised Hitler and he blamed the Jews. Even starting, even stating with the aims, even stating, sorry, that the aims of the Nazi government and Jehovah's Witnesses, or Bible students as they were known at the time, were the same, saying the Bible researchers of Germany are following are fighting for the very same high ethical goals and ideals which also the national government of the German Reich proclaimed. Let's, as for the Jews, let's see what he spoke to Hitler about them for. It is falsely charged by our enemies that we receive financial support from our work from the Jews. Nothing is further from the truth. Never has been the slightest bit of money contributed to our work by Jews. Hmm, sounds loving, doesn't it? It has been the commercial Jews of the British Empire that have built up and carried on big business as a means of exploiting and oppressing the peoples of many nations. Instead of being against the principles advocated by the government of Germany, we stand, we stand squarely for such principles. As you can see back then, when everyone else was picking up arms to stop this fascist monster and his armies marching across Europe, the Jehovah's Witnesses were kissing Hitler's ass, attacking Jews and offering support for the Nazis. You couldn't make it up, could you? In at number four... It's taking longer because it's a long one. Terrible leadership. Bated breath. The one thing Jehovah's Witnesses have to recommend them is their smart, dedicated leadership. 
<laughs> Only kidding, they're morons. From their founder, Charles T. S. Russell and Joseph Rutherford, to modern luminaries like Tony Tight Pants Morris or Stephen Is He Retarded? You Better Believe It Let. Jehovah's Witnesses have had over a century of fucking idiots. They were founded by a dodgy semi criminal called Charles T. S. Russell. He believed in ideas that I've spoken about, like pyramidology, the belief that God made the pyramids because they're big and you can get secret messages by measuring them. He believed this so strongly that even today his grave site boasts a pyramid on it. He also thought he could bless crops, as I've mentioned as well, in order to increase yields. A cynical person might just say he was reselling the seeds he bought at market price for a massive markup because he was a big fraudulent bastard. Indeed, that's exactly what the court said. But we all know he was really just trying to help the kids. This guy is his age's version of one of those African princes who tries to get you to hide a hundred million pounds in your account, but he just needs your details first. <laughs> he was as religious as he was clever, not very. Thankfully, God was able to look around the globe and choose him as his Laodicean minister, or minister his sole representative on earth. Time prevents me from going into every leader of the Jehovah's Witness. Suffice to say, it doesn't get much better. Russell was replaced by Joseph Judge Rutherford. He was a drunk and a bully and just a prick in general. He used church funds to buy a farm in California, which he promised to look after on behalf of the prophets until they were resurrected. There's a word for that. I think it's fraud. Modern leaders have fared little better. No doubt they have been much better at hiding their crimes, but don't worry, they're still just as dumb and opinionated as ever. Let's take some gems from that spiritual behemoth, Tony Tight Pants Morris. So called because he seemingly invented the new sin of men wearing metrosexual or too tight clothing. You heard me right. If a Jehovah's Witness male fancies throwing on a pair of drainpipe jeans or a woman takes a liking to yoga pants, who doesn't, they can be, now be excommunicated, cut off from their family and condemned to eternal destruction unless they very quickly fly right and go back to dressing like they just emerged from the back of an 18th century pioneer wagon. How dare he do this, this dream killer? He takes away cute bombs from mankind? I'm not having it. What's next? He's going to have abs on men or suck the sweetness out of chocolate bars? It's as far as I'm willing to go. I say save the yoga pants. Then you have to wonder at the wonder of our age that is Stephen Lett. Now I've looked high and low to find the criteria for becoming a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And nowhere does it say you need to have an extra chromosome. But God bless them, they let Stephen let in anyway. Oh my goodness, if you take a look at this elderly Jim Henson looking puppet, you'll instantly wonder how he became a leader of an internationally known cult. When you hear his flat, poorly acted voice and style, his, you'll wonder who's left alive in his family to sign him out of the hospital for the weekends. Oh dear, dear me, I'm running out of patience with these people. Number three, the UN scandal. When I grew up, <clears throat> pardon me, when I grew up as a devout Jehovah's Witness, I was taught a lot of bullshit. But one of the most constant and pervasive shovel loads that we had to swallow was this. Now I'm going to read from the 1984 September 15th Watchtower. In it, it says, Now the UN is not a blessing. Even though the religious clergy of Christendom and the rabbis of Jewry, there's a bit of that anti-Semitism again, pray again, heaven's blessing upon that organization, it is really the image of the wild beast, the, the visible political commercial organization of the god of this system of things, Satan the devil. So the UN will soon be destroyed along with that beastly organization. That's right. Every Jehovah's Witness is taught that the United Nations is evil. In fact, members are not allowed to have anything to do with it or anything who, anyone who is affiliated with it under pain of excommunication. Imagine my surprise then when I learnt that my own church had been a member of this most evil of all organisations since 1991 and only left two days after it was revealed by the Guardian newspaper in 2001. They said it was so they could use the library in New York but swearing loyalty to, you, to the UN, which is supposed to be Satan's visible organization on Earth, which is they actually have to do for membership so that they can check out a copy of War and Peace a little bit closer to their flat, seems a high price to pay for the same time excommunicating their own members who felt inclined to support the UN's charitable works. Needless to say, the rules don't count if you're a JW leader. 
If they want to join the UN while simultaneously condemning it, well, you better get with the program and shut your damn mouth. Number two. Dum dum dum. We're coming to the end. 1975. Throughout the 1960s, Jehovah's Witnesses were led down the garden path. Yes, we had a fish hook in our mouths and we were dragged down. We were taught in nearly every magazine or book that the leaders printed that God had decided to end the world soon. Ooh. And that they had good news. Not only was it soon, it was very soon. 1975, in fact. That's right, the Jehovah's Witness leaders had heard from God and he had told them that in 1975 he was coming back in glorious technicolor. And this time it was personal. It was like Rambo 3. Those poor Viet Cong didn't know what was going to happen. In just a few short years, you too could be living in Paradise Earth with no debt, a new house and a baby lion cub. All you had to do to enjoy this awesome future was to join the Jehovah's Witnesses, give up your dreams and plans, hold off on your education, or preferably don't get one, <laughs> and give up any pressing medical needs that you might have, and then get your ass out on the ministry to tell people other, tell other people about this pipe dream and get them to join. Sadly for the Jehovah's Witnesses, and happily for all of you who would have been killed by God and whose eyes were going to be pecked out by crows, the end never did come. And despite a significant number of Jehovah's Witnesses drifting away, the Jehovah's Witnesses tried a new tactic to deal with this colossal humiliation. They pretended they never said anything. Instead of admitting that they were dumb and begging forgiveness, they decided to hide it. And then when forced to, they just blamed their own members. The Jehovah's Witnesses leaders decided that despite over a decade of constant name dropping and date dropping and dropping and promises about the end coming in 75, it wasn't there really. It wasn't really their problem. Well, and if you thought it did, screw you. Dear me, now guys, we've reached that time. We're now at number one, and I have decided to make this a joint top mistake of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Coming in jointly is the Jehovah's Witness Blood Doctrine and Pedophilia. I'm going to start with the Blood Doctrine. Jehovah's Witnesses do not take blood, ever. Unless they do, but only if they ask nicely. You see, God didn't want blood to be used in uh, the Bible because it symbolized the importance of life. And now, three and a half thousand years later, and when mankind can actually use blood to save lives, thereby truly showing the importance we view life, they continue to carry on under this narrow understanding of the Bible. Time does move slowly, sadly too slowly, for the thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses who have died refusing blood, as modern Jehovah's Witnesses are now allowed to use a little bit of their own judgment about whether to exact certain small blood fractions that are needed in situations. It's a bit like a dieter saying they won't eat a chocolate bar, but they will eat cocoa fat and sugar so long as they are in separate wrappers. Jehovah's Witnesses also forbid donating blood too. Even though they may take blood products containing blood, uh, generously donated by others, which makes them not just hypocrites, but selfish. And it is this policy that has cost thousands of Jehovah's life that tops our list. Our joint number one, we can't leave it out. That's right, it's paedophilia. Child rape and churchmen go together like wine and cheese these days. Nowadays you can hardly kick over a church pew without finding an elderly paedophile priest and a howling choir boy. But don't think for a second, that's just the Catholics who are into kids. Oh no, for decades now the Jehovah's Witnesses have been up and comers in the rape and physical abuse of our children. I look back to my childhood and thank God that I was an ugly baby, as it seems there was hardly a child free in any kingdom hall worldwide that wasn't fending off the advantage of advances of horny elders and ministerial servants. But this happens in every church, you say. That's right, it does. And the test of that church is how they deal with it when it happens. So how did God's self-styled only representatives on earth deal with it when its leaders raped all those kittywinks? Well, they ignored it, hid it, lied about it, threatened the victims and their parents, and even their wider families. They destroyed records and smeared anyone who brought up the subject until they had built up a bunker of denial, and from it they continue to hide and stare angrily as courts and TV reporters dredge up more and more stories of complacence and cover-up. But it doesn't end there. If a Jehovah's Witness church is vandalised, the local elders have to go immediately to the police. If they are told of a child rape, they are to contact head office and stay silent until further notice. This is just the beginning 
of the depths of support victims will receive. If a victim cannot provide two witnesses to the crime, they are to remain silent about it. Both they and their parents will be punished with excommunication if they talk to others. Unless state or national laws explicitly state that they have to report child abuse accusations to the police, Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to do so. Child rapists have been allowed to remain in the congregations in positions of power for decades, free to continue their crimes, all because the church didn't want the bad publicity. How's that working out for you now? Abusers who go to court have frequently been supported by their own church and have had glowing letters of recommendation read on their behalf by the elders. All the while the victims are shunned and vilified. Years later, when these monsters are released, they are often welcomed back with open arms and often promoted again quickly to positions of power while the kids they raped are left to seek justice through the courts. Jesus said, But who shall offend one of these little ones? which believe in me, it would be better that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Let's hope that, unlike Jehovah's Witness predictions, that day comes soon for the Jehovah's Witness leadership. Thank you very much for watching this video. And if you are an ex-Jehovah's Witness, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a person who's considering leaving the Jehovah's Witness, I'm always happy to talk to you. Please leave me a message and I'll get back. Bye-bye.